Sure. Bear with me. I'm going to be going through both the. Um, I'm using two computers. I'm not dealing with their technology. Okay, so advanced hemodynamics. Okay, so now we're going to apply these principles. So just remember that you know we have a relationship between the right and the left heart. The left heart relies on the blood passage going through compliant pulmonary arteries, vasculature from the right heart to the left heart, and the, the right heart only works well if it's got uh, if it stays compliant and it has good preload, right? And when that goes askew, you're going to have changes in your hemodynamics. So we're just hoping that everything sort of works perfectly and stuff from just the strict cardiac side of things. The right heart and left heart both respond the same way to pressure changes and to preload changes. So these graphs are important to look at that. You know, so pressure changes, the more pressure you have, um, oh, surprise it's actually pressure. Oh, this is volume pressure. So the more volume you have, the more your pressure goes up, which makes sense. That's just compliance. Um, I think we have more graphs that I'll show you on, the, on here that'll be easier to follow. Uh, we also have to make sure when we talk about the balance between everything is that our heart rate's normal, right? Sinus, normal R to R intervals and stuff. We're also having normal P to R intervals, which is your preload. So if you saw a question that's talking about PR intervals and stuff, I'm talking about preload because that's your atrial kick. That's adding that 25% of blood to your left or right ventricle. They both require preload. This is actually going to be, so up here is your Frank Starlings. Next slide. This one. Perfect. Okay, so on this slide we see here, this is your Frank Starlings curve. So as we stretch the biocytes, we get to a certain point that's actually very ideal. And as a result, you know, the peak of this is you get the best ventricular response the best contractility to pump that blood forward, which is good. You also get a reflux too, which is called what? Your heart rate increases as well as your contractility, which is now there's two ways you deal with the increase in cardiac output because you have more blood. So you've got to get the blood through. You can't have blood back up. When blood backs up, you either cause pulmonary edema if it backs up in the left side of the heart, or you cause systemic edema, pitting edema in your legs, for instance, if it backs up from the right side. So we never want that to happen. We want everything to be perfect. So if you send more blood back to the right heart, the right heart stretches. It says, I have to increase my tractility, Frank Starling's law. And then one other thing happens. So not only increase stroke volume, but you also increase what? Stroke volume times equals cardiac output. What's the law called that's increasing the heart rate from that stretch in the atrium? Is it? Bainbridge. Bainbridge. Perfect. Yep. Increase your heart rate. Either thing is both doing the same thing, which is just like, let's keep the blood moving, keep it moving, keep it moving. The last thing you want to do when you're jumping out of the down a mercy slide of airplanes for the crowd to get all bunched up and stuff and falling all over each other. Like turbulent flows, all that stuff, you know, the plane's burning. So you want to get everyone off on down the slide in a, a neat, orderly fashion. And you can do that by getting them to move out faster, right? Uh, so you increase the speed, which is cardiac output. You increase the speed in this case by increasing your, your heart rate and increasing your contractility and stuff. Because the preload's already there. You know, the preload's already contributing to heart, cardiac output indirectly, but the heart's got to do something with it because as you're filling the chamber up with blood, the chamber can only stretch so much. And it gets to the point where it, it can't be any more compliant to that blood. Now, the right heart is more compliant to the left heart because the right heart has got smaller walls, right? It's more compliant, takes more volume, which is great because it's getting blood from the IVC and the SVC. It's getting a large volume of blood, and luckily it sends that large volume of blood into a very compliant pulmonary vasculature as well. Now, the left heart's not as compliant, but you know, we'll just can say the normal heart is X, and then anything that gets bigger after that becomes less compliant. But comparing these two, it's not as compliant. It needs to be more big, it needs to be stronger because it has to overcome higher resistant forces, which is your systemic vascular uh, resistance, right? You're, 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 you're pumping against blood pressures of like 100 or greater. So how well you function is inversely related to how much resistance that you give it. So at a certain point, even as your uh, afterload and resistance increases and stuff, you will decrease in your performance of your heart. I do know that like, this actually shows up right here. So like as your SVR gets bigger, it drops your cardiac output. 
Where you get confused is, is that as you drop your cardiac output, you're not, you, you're, what you're noticing is a better map, right? Whoa, increasing SVR increases your map, right? So it's the firefighter with the tiny hose with the high pressure, but not as much water coming out of that straw. Dumping out into this is gonna have high pressures, low flow, but your heart is not gonna respond kindly over time to increase resistance. What it does to compensate for that is it becomes thicker. So what kind of hypertrophy, there's, it becomes hypertrophic, right? There's two kinds of hypertrophy, what are they? Concentric. Concentric. Which one responds to high afterload pressures? Which one is the response? Concentric, Concentric get thicker, pump against higher pressures. The center is gonna be the dilated type of cardiomyopathy, which is usually responding to high volume states. So volume and compliance, uh, I don't know what the A, B, and C is, but one of these is normal. And then eventually, like, one of these, oh, no, it does say it there. So decreased compliance, which is going to be B, this is your hypertrophic concentric heart. It is, because when you think of concentric, when you think of hypertrophy, you're just saying more muscle mass. Muscle mass can be the huge bicep, right, or it can... You ever see the really big bodybuilders that have huge upper bodies and skinny legs, right? So that person might seem like they're super muscular, but the, it's the, but the person who's got like the football player is like big upper body, big lower body. If you weigh muscle pounds per pounds, the football player probably is a little bit bigger than the guy that's got the huge biceps, no pecs, you know, no abs, just biceps, right? The eyes and tries. So it gets confusing, but the center is C here. So eccentric is C, it's still, it's still hypertrophy, but it's, it's got more muscle because it's gotten elongated. So it's not in parallel, it's in series, versus A is normal. And, so, and the reason why you have more volume as you read this curve is because, well, it's a big old flabby heart. It doesn't contract well, but it's got a big chamber. You gotta fill that chamber up before you get high pressures. The concentric has a smaller filling chamber because it's got so much muscle, there's nowhere for the fluid to go. So you fill it up quicker with less fluid. Okay, we went over all this stuff. We'll keep going. Keep going. Let's see what this says in difference. Oh, so stroke volume also plays a role. So if you read these charts, let's go scroll up on this one a little bit okay so if i'm reading these charts and stuff I, we saw that our stroke volume will go down after a while if you give too much afterload okay so too much afterload our stroke volume goes down because we're not able to now think about this if your left heart starts off with 120 cc's but it takes forever for your heart to contract and pump that point so end diastole 120 cc's for your end diastole volume, when you try and factor, you try and figure out what your EF is, which is right here, end diastolic volume. So if you start off with your end diastolic volume of like 120 cc's and you contract and you try and get that out over an aortic stenotic valve, or in this case, let's say hypertension, that valve only opens once you generate enough pressure, right? When you think of isovolumetric systole, once you pass that pressure threshold and that valve opens, then the volume leaves. But if it takes forever for the volume to leave, before you know it, systole is over and the valve shuts closed because the pressure outside is higher than pressure inside, that valve closed, and now only a proportion of your blood actually got out. So when you like look at this afterload here, if you get less volume out because you have such high afterload pressures that when you're trying to contract, you're effectively only getting a small stroke volume because stroke volume is, is what's in the heart after you contract it. Well, if it took forever to get the volume physically out and you start off with 120 cc's and you ended up after systole was done with let's say 80 cc's, the difference is 40, right? So 40 cc's got out, it took forever to open the gate to get them out. So 40 is your end systolic divided, or your end systolic volume divided by your starting volume. So 40 divided by 120 is what? Can't do the math myself. Oh, it's it's 30 percent. Yeah, 40. 30, yeah. So you have a 33 percent ejection fracture. It's not good. It's not a normal stroke volume because normal stroke volume would have been about 60 to 80 or 60 to 100. 
So compliance. So we talked about compliance. There's a certain point on the curve where compliance, you get the most bang for your buck with volume without causing too much pressure. Pressure is workload. So that's like between B and A. Once you get to B, you have a ton of pressure. And when you get to like, when you start off at A, you're not getting that much volume, minimal pressure without that much volume. And then the compliance curve, as far as like how compliant you are, the curve starts to shift down or up. So you become less compliant um, as you shift down, you become more compliant as you shift up. Or no, opposite actually, opposite, yeah, opposite. Increase compliance as you shift down, decrease compliance as you shift up. Again, because it's more and more pressures with less and less volume. And what do you think that does? So if we draw a picture of that, I always like to draw, I don't know if drawing helps, but hopefully it helps. Really out of space here. Um, All right, so what does that really mean? Well, when I talk about like we're gonna say left ventricle here. Oh, writing too much. All right, so a trick for these is if you tie a, a, a string on the end and you twirl it around, it centrifuges all the liquid to the tip, and then you can, it lasts longer. So, you know, it's a neat fact, right? It's like a YouTube video. All right, so left ventricle. Oh, this is an illustration, a graphic illustration of what I'm talking about when you, when you say the stroke volume is going to go down when you have increasing pressures to open up the air valve. So you don't open your valves unless you overcome the outside pressures. That gradient to get there is the isovolectric systole, right? When you have that, that graph, I don't even know how the graph looks, but I don't know, it's like a, the graph looks like this, right? You have like the one part that goes straight up, there's no change, then it changes, and then down. That's if you have like good valves. I think that's what I'm talking about, right? Yes. Remember that? Waves? Okay. This part here, when there's no change in volume, this is the volume part, and there's only changes in pressure, which is right here on the y-axis. That's isovolmetric. Um, so you fill your left ventricle normally and diastole. The more diastole you have, the more time you have to fill your left ventricle, which is good. Diastole is good. When the heart's not contracting, dia during diastole, it's not contracting, that's more time for your coronaries to perfuse as well. It's the main time that the coronaries actually perfuse at what part in the myocardium? Subendocardium, the bulk of the intramural part of your myocardium is subendocardium. It only perfuses during diastole. Uh, the, the epicardium perfuses sometimes during di uh, systole, but it perfuses better during diastole. But subendocardium only does it during that. So again, this is like increased work of your heart. You need more coronary blood flow, but then you get less if your heart beats faster because you have less blood flow during the coronaries when it's beating so fast. So during diastole, you fill up this thing with preload from your left ventricle, left atrium, which is preload from your right ventricle, which is hopefully working good, which had good preload from your systemic vasculature. You're hoping all those systems line up. It perfectly dumps, let's say, um, I don't know, let's say 140 milliliters of blood in your left ventricle. So at this given time, this is your end diastolic volume. Your end diastolic volume. And then you magically overcome the pressures of the aortic valve, and then the valve opens, and the heart, based on its contractility, based on a lot of factors, dumps out. What's your normal EF? So I'm going to say, so you start off with 140, and then you dump out this much, and this is the what remains is your end systolic volume. So what's a normal EF? We started with about 140 cc's and we contracted it, let's say, let's say 60%. What's 60% of 140? Someone do it on your phone. Eighty-four. Eighty-four? Sixty is eighty-four, so one forty minus eighty-four is like fifty-nine. Oh wait, hold on, sixty, eighty-four, six, seventy. Yeah, 30, 76. 76? All right, so 76. So then I'd say, oh, what's left in the heart? And you say, oh, at the, at the end of Sicily, the heart got out 
everything but 76. So I say, okay, well, what's your ejection fracture? 76 divided by 140. So now do that number. It should come back to be 60. Is it 60? It's 54, I think. Is it 54? I do the number wrong. I think it's 76, not 76. Okay, nervous. So 140 minus 84 equals 56. So your N is not, oh, that's 56. So then I do the math, I'm like, what's my EF? And here's my EF. It's, as you guys are telling me, it's 60%, right? And you say, yes, it's normal. So when you guys look at a T uh, and an echocardiogram, you're like, yes, it's over 50. I'm, I don't care, whatever's going on. Let's play a new game. New game is this. Here's my heart. This person has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. My box is only that thing. I have increased or decreased compliance in the, in the ventricle. This is left ventricle still. Decreased compliance. I got a smaller volume. Right? I can only put so much in there. I got these big thick walls because this person's had long standing either aortic stenosis or maybe long standing like systemic hypertension. At the end of systole, and you know, again, or at the end of diastole, again, we don't, there's only other factors we can mess around with too. Like, but let's just say at the end of diastolic volume, so they diastole, the atrium works, puts in the right amount of blood, the right ventricle doesn't have dysfunction, and I get. And you know, based on the compliance, you can only get so much volume in there because the pressure is going to shoot up, right? As soon as you start filling this baby up, the pressures are going through the roof. Like you're going to have a hard time over putting much more blood in here. So let's say all I get in, so my pressures are maxed out there, and then that valve, that heart closes that. What valve closes to the to the left atrium? Mitral valve, right? Closes. Closes, you're done. End diastolic volume in this person, this is a small little chamber, is 70. Luckily, this person's got a super charged up ventricle. It's got a lot of muscle. And for now, it's working pretty well. It's compensating. Eventually, it's going to get dysfunctional. And you're going to have high risk for arrhythmias as people get older and stuff. So this is diastolic heart failure. This is where you have the low compliant my concentric myocardium, the left ventricle. So very low compliance. You feel barely any blood in. That pressure goes to the root. At the end of systole, the person still is able to like pretty much get as much of that out. You might see an end systolic arm at the end of this, which is like 20, right? Let's just do this. I don't know the numbers now. So you do 20 divided by, sorry. That's right. You do, it's your stroke volume. So your stroke volume here is the difference is you start off with 70, you end up with 20 in here. So what got out was 50. That's your stroke volume. So what's 50 divided by 70? 71 percent, right? And so if you, and this is where I like to show these things. If you said whose heart was better? You're going to say that the, this person's got the better heart. I want 71%. But do you really want 50 cc's of blood at 1.3 milliliters per hemoglobin for content? Who's actually going to give the, send the, the right amount of blood to the entire systemic vascular system? 50 cc's of stroke volume every minute or every beat? Or is it going to be the person with the last one, which was how many, what was the stroke volume for the last one? 84. So last one, the old one, A was 84. This one is only 50. So you got to remember, if the EF doesn't tell you everything, and the, the priority is, is the oxygen content and delivery and consumption. Demand and supply. Difference between heart failure, monitoring. Okay, flow track. Algorithms figure out, basically, without having a swan Gans catheter in, what the left heart's doing based on proprietary information. It looks at the pulse pressure waveform of the artery or of the SAO2 like waveform. It's figuring out compliance too in the middle of all that. So they use this kurtussis and skewness. You don't have to memorize these names and stuff, but if you ever were asked it, basically you can see in the waveform here which vessel is more compliant based on the waveform. So the more of a peak waveform and stuff, the lower the compliance. Low, 
Low compliance is higher pressures, so higher peaks, right? High compliance means lower pressures, so you kind of think of it as like flat, it's more neutral and stuff. And then skewness when it comes to resistance. FlowTrack takes all that information amongst other things about the patient's characteristics, comes up with like a chi, it's a conversion factor. Most of the time it's only doing this every 60 seconds, so it's like in real time, it's not accurate. It's whatever you did was probably done 60 seconds ago. Some of the newer ones are coming out with like faster updates or faster cycles where it tells you accurate information so you can titrate your pressors appropriately. You have to make sure that the system is obviously got the right patient demographics in, your, your bag is pumped up to 300 millimeters of mercury. The other thing is you have to take away variables when it comes to like using this technology to be able to understand what you're looking at. So you wanna be able to take away the variable of ventilation. Every time you take a deep breath and spontaneous respirations, you increase your intrathoracic um, volume, right? And that's how you get air in, but that negative pressure also pulls in more preload. More preload is gonna skew the results of what your actual um, cardiac output is and your stroke volume and stroke volume variation. So by doing, by putting people on volume control with a very similar set of tidal volumes allows us to really figure out what the resuscitation status is. This is the stuff that we already talked about in detail. We talked about all this stuff. So what, what's significant? Significant is, and then some of this flow track stuff also gives you SVO2s. And it can give you like their version, which is like SCVO2, which is not as accurate as SVO2, but you know, something like what's a hard stop is if you have a decrease or increase by five to 10% of SVO2. What does that mean? Think about what we talked about. Either it means you're not getting enough oxygen or you're using too much of it. Talked about all these things. So we'll just kind of go through. So SCVO2 is usually just your superior vena cava. That's where your central lines go into. It's pretty accurate until when it matters. And when you're unstable, then it's not accurate. But the point I wanna get across here is that when you have the patient who you really need to use it on, it's no longer accurate. The comparison of SCVO2 to SVO2, you're trending it. So you should be trending every so often, sending off uh, an SVO2 if you're able to, let's say you, you have a Swan Gans catheter in and stuff, you send off the pulmonary, like the pulmonary blood, and then you compare it to the probe that's also in the, in the probably in the superior vena cava or somewhere up there to see what's accurate and to, to trend it, you're trending it. Because you can't always assume that your PAO2 in your arterial system is what your SAT's telling you because of left and right shifting. So your SAT's not a good indicator too, that's why we put in A lines, we send off ABGs every so often. You're trending things. You're also trending the changes and differences in CO2 and PACO2s as well because of ventilation perfusion mismatching. So it's all trends. We still have, we still watch CO2, we don't give up on it. So SVO2 is the same as SVO2 with 70%. I say 75, but they say it's 70% and stuff. How it's affected, we've already talked about. PEEP, ventilation, and F5-2 can place immense amounts of intrathoracic pressures, positive pressures that can not only affect the pericardium and as far as blood flow through the right heart, which is supposed to be compliant, which might not be anymore, but also the pulmonary vasoture as well, which you go back to the west zones of the lung. As you add more PEEP, you transition people's natural zones from ideal is always two to more one because of peak, which means you're decreasing blood flow, more forward moving flow, which means you're decreasing preload to the left heart because you're adding increasing amounts of peak, which eventually does become very, very diminishing the cardiac output from the right side and then obviously to the left side. There's reasons why we do it with ARDSP patients and stuff, but when you get start talking about getting over like 10 of peak, that's when you start getting the problems. ClearSight is another system that gives you basically a lot of the same things. So the protocols are here. So basically I'm gonna have an average amount of like changes. Like I'm gonna just, you're basically looking at SVVs of like 12 to 13% are what we're gonna be using. And then, as, and then we're gonna also talk about like when to do like fluid bolusing. They have different protocols that they've done studies on for different types of like patient populations, but um, 
we're going to try and average out and make it simple, one size fits all. So stroke volume variation, when does it work and when does it not work? So you have to have someone on tidal volumes of less than eight because you don't want to have too much endothoracic pressure changes, but you want them on volume control. You don't want them spontaneously breathing. So obviously full control, full mandatory breathing, paralyzed is ideal. Doesn't work with right ventricular failure because you, you won't know when you have right heart problems and you're using, because a pulmonary catheter is just a left heart problem identifier. It doesn't really tell you what's going on with the left heart. We assumed it did 40 years ago, but it really doesn't. Like all these other things can go wrong along the way to the left heart that you might think you have a left heart problem, but you don't, it's a right heart problem. So you have to put a right heart catheter in to see if it's a right heart problem. That's why you, when you want to see what's going on with the left heart, they do left heart cast, right? There's a difference between the two. This technology is looking at the left heart. If something's wrong with the right heart, you really don't know until you can, you can't rule it out unless you put a right heart catheter in. So that's why they say you shouldn't probably use it for this. Uh, intra-abdominal pressures are gonna obviously throw this off too. Uh, you're gonna have hemodynamic changes from that. No, I don't that. All right, fluid responsiveness. So one of the things you can do right away is you can do a passive leg raise. You put the device on, you tell it you're about to do a, a passive leg raise because you're staring at a, because let's say this is a situation where you don't, you're not looking at anything else, you see your map suck. You're like, what should I do? You're saying your preceptor, should I give fluid or should I give pressors? Well, do a passive leg raise test. That's one thing. We know most of these people are, are probably a little bit dry. So you passive leg raise, and if your stroke volume goes up by 10%, so let's say your stroke volume goes from 50 calculated algorithm to like whatever 10% of that is. So if it goes up to 56, that's 10% increase. Therefore, positive sign that that person is gonna respond to fluid give more fluid. So as soon as you put the legs down, you just lost your preload. So guess what? Give 250 cc's of actual fluid. And basically, and that's because you're on the middle part of the curve. You're on the curve between point, you're on the curve curve of here to here, where more volume makes a difference. It adds your stroke volume and increases, or it increases your stroke volume with your preload. I guess I don't have the, that is preload, yeah, so that is preload. Increases your stroke volume. Give fluid till it doesn't work. So once your stroke volume doesn't go up by 10%, stop giving fluid. Then you go back to the, your, your hemodynamics here, and you're like, okay, if it's not a preload issue, what other options do I have? I can increase the heart rate, or I can increase the afterload, or I can increase the contractility. If all I'm thinking about is just getting a nice map on the on the on the machine, right? Doesn't mean you know those things can affect cardiac output differently, but that's how you're looking at this. You're 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 guiding your therapy based on something more tangible than just give phenylephrine, give a phenylephrine for a low heart rate. Like that doesn't make a lot of like clinical sense. You know what are you really treating? So here's one option. If we go through this option here with Calvo Fixino, they looked at abdominal surgeries and stuff like that. Basically, you go through the algorithm and you give you give fluid load. If it increases, if the stroke volume responds well, you keep giving fluid until it doesn't respond. Once it doesn't respond, but you don't have good, you don't have maps pretty much. Your maps don't look good. You then look and ask yourself, okay, I gave fluid. It doesn't work. I come down to optimal. How do I optimize my stroke volume? Which we already said, stroke volume right here. I've done preload. It's not working. It no longer responds. So then it asks you the difference between either a vasopressor or an inotrope. Vasopressor, inotrope, contractility. But the inotrope will also do heart rate too. You know, there's some mix between the two. And if you're the only way to know that one is to look at your cardiac index versus your MAP. If your MAP is low but your cardiac index looks good, it tells you to start a vasopressor. If your MAP is great but your index sucks, it says start an inotrope. So you think back and well, why is that? So if my MAP right here, my MAP sucks, what does it want me to do? It wants me to start a vasopressor. If I start a vasopressor and I increase my SVR, my MAP will get better. If I 
have a low cardiac input index and a good nap so cardiac output here is a good one so I have a good nap or let's do this one there's different equations I do know that this can get confusing cardiac input my map looks good what are my options increase my heart rate inotrope increase my stroke volume by increasing contractility inotrope it's not perfect you could you'll still probably get what you're looking for by doing both at the same time levofed alpha 1 beta 1 versus just something that's only anotropic like you know dubetamine for instance but this is trying to simplify all that so stroke volume variation is like a dynamic measurement versus just a calculated measurement with stroke volume increasing by 10 percent so it's based now on, on percentage this says you'll see changes but you want to go based on mine, which is 12 to 13 or less. So like, let's say less than 12 to 13. That's the number we'll use for the task. It's the most consistent throughout all this. So we already saw the slide, which says how to get like a normal stroke volume variation without, with having like consistent, uh, uh, what's it called, volume control breathing and so on, and not having an increased abdominal pressures and open chest and all that. If you have that, you can't do any of this. So greater than 12%. So if you, so this is so funny, right? This is like literally taking an A-line. Um, when you look at like my A-line lecture chart, I actually talk about how the A-line waveform tells you a lot about contractility, tells you a lot about what your afterload is. Well, they developed this technology as a result of all that. And they don't tell you how they do it, but that's basically looking at your A-line. Your A-line tells you a lot of things. Exactly how to gauge what it's telling you is difficult, but you can gauge contractility afterload from your A-line with all this technology. And the other thing that we do in the hospital is we look at variability. So if this P, if the top of the A-wave, A-line's here, the next one's here, the next one's up there, the next one's there, it's variable. Variability usually tells you that your fluid under resuscitated. So guess what? They come out with this new fancy thing called stroke volume variation. It's looking, it has its own way of doing it, but it's basically telling you if you're very variable, so you're greater than 12 to 13%, you're fluid responsive. So in this case, you give 250 cc. So it's always 250 cc bolus. If you're not, if you don't have variation and stuff, um, and you don't have stroke volume drop, if you have no variation, but you, your stroke volume drop greater than 10%, you'd also give a bolus and stuff. Maybe the technology's not reading it right. I don't really know. If it's under 8% and everything is normal you don't do anything as far as fluid goes if you have bad cardiac outputs or you have bad maps again you consider the inotrope versus the vasoconstrictor and this tells you again which one to use based on what's going on these are just different protocols that do the same thing you'll start to notice that some of them factor in well what's a normal map is map 65 no it could be something completely different when you're in a sitting position for a craniotomy and the map is 65 and like on the test the patient's blood pressure let's say has a map of 65 but you're measuring the blood pressure at their cuff and their arm what would be their normal map then for cerebral perfusion so that person's map would not be correct because you need 65 if that's their normal within 20 percent 65 and their brain right now the difference between there and their brain could be 10 points or more well you have to have a higher map so in this case the patient needs you to respond how do you respond to this patient it'll be a cardiac related or respiratory or something like that but again you would have to like go through these values and stuff and determine do i give fluid do i start an iotrope or do i start a presser this is just another graph looking at all of the different contributing factors which we've gone heavily through that's it.